looking at worship, and uh, we're on lesson number three. However, uh, I've been trying to bathe my mind in the Word of God and reading things about worship. I'd like to add a few things tonight, uh, just uh, before we jump back into our notes. I say this, I think worship is kind of like this. Uh, let me just use everyday illustration uh, to tell you what I think worship is like. Um, I typically, before I leave my home, I don't kiss my girls in the morning. I would not want to wake them up that early. And uh, I have my wife have uh, two little girls up that early. I always go ahead and kiss my wife goodbye. But if they're awake, I always give them a uh, kiss goodbye. And so tonight, I was getting ready to come to church and uh, I wanted to get here at a certain time. And I said, okay, can daddy kiss goodbye? So I went over and Bella, she's, I gave her a kiss. She said, no, huggy hug. She threw her arms around me and said, I didn't me. She said, I love you. And I said, oh, I love you too. And then grandma, I gave her a kiss. And she gave me a kiss and all of a sudden she turned around and slapped a kiss on the other cheek and I uh, said, I love you. I think worship is like that. Now how, how does a father feel when we give him above and beyond even what, you know, maybe is the, the expected. And, uh, you know, uh, a week and a half ago, I was rushing. I was trying to get to church on a Sunday night. And our same little routine, Brother Eli, I wanted to give my girls and I a kiss goodbye, but they were upstairs. And I thought, I'm just going to slide out without there being any type of, like, uh, interjection that would hinder me from getting here. Brother Craig, I was just about to pull out on 209, and the phone rang, and it was my wife. And she said that Bella wants her daddy to hug her. And she said, maybe if you talk to her on the phone. Nope, it didn't work. So guess what? I turned around. I went back home, and she was waiting at the door. But it was worth it. It was worth it for her. It was worth it for me. Amen. Do you know, I believe that praise and worship is like that. Sometimes it takes us a little bit out of our, uh, you know, it takes us out of maybe what our routine is or even what our planned schedule is, and it takes us to just worshiping God um, because He longs for it and because He wants it. Our heart says, well, I'll do whatever I can do to worship God. In my reading this week, I... I uh, was challenged by an author who said sometimes we're busy with life and we live in towns and we live in cities and we're, uh, we're obligated to schedule that sometimes we forget the beauty of things around us. We forget the mountains and their majesty. We forget the mist that rises on the mountain. We forget the stars and all their majesty and everything about that. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 we, 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 we lose our wonder. We lose our wonder. In fact, the writer said it this way. He says, our wonder begins to wither. That was interesting. Our wonder begins to wither. Now think about this. How many of you pay, and maybe you're different than me, but you notice the moon and the stars as much as you did when you were a kid. And then you, you, you think that they were following you. And uh, you look at the majesty of the mountain about you, and even the fog lifting on the mountain, uh, 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 the way the rain works, the, uh, the rainbow in the sky, whatever it is. You know, we, we sometimes seem to lose the wonder of it all. And our wonder begins to wither. But before we can ever talk about worship, there really has to be a wonder to God. There has to be a wonder to God and who He is before we can ever really uh, take a grand entrance into worship. And worship uh, 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 cannot uh, just be of the sole rationale of man. Now, uh, uh, when, 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 uh, without awe and wonder of our life, our worship only lives on the edge of ourself and who we are. But when we have a wonder and awe of God, it leaves us, amen, it leaves the edge of who we are and where we are at, and it gets us into the presence of God. 
Amen. Don't you want to leave the edge of where you are and where you stop and you enter into the presence of God? That is really worship when we have wonder and awe of God and, and, and who He is. And so, uh, leaving ourselves, amen, I wonder if our worship, do we ever, ever get to the presence of God, or do we never leave ourselves? Modern worship is never leaving ourselves. Biblical worship and the worship that God desires is the leaving of ourselves and the entering into His presence. Amen. As we worship Him, entering into His gates and entering into His courts and, and entering into who He is. And so I, I want us to think about worship being an experience or worship being an event. Now, there is a difference between worship being an experience and worship being an event. When Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden, travel with me way back to the beginning of, uh, of time, when God created that man and woman, He placed them in the garden, and uh, as they were placed there, it was not just an event of worship, but it was an experience of worship. I mean, think about everything that they were, everything that they did, amen, it was simply uh, 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 around God. Uh, their experience was ongoing. Uh, because uh, they, 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 they had an exchange with God because they had gratitude and they lived in God and everything that they, they, they received and everything about their life uh, was because God was there. And so they had this exchange of worship. Think, think about this. We, we think about them not wearing clothes. Why? Because they were clothed with the glory of God. And so they worshiped God. Uh, they, they were naked and they were not ashamed. God provided everything for Adam and Eve and all their needs, and their response was gratitude and reverence and honor and submission, amen, to, 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 to a holy God. The experience was soon interrupted. And instead of it being an experience, it became an event. They found themselves, they fell in sin, they partook where they shouldn't have. The enemy got his foothold in. And so the enemy doesn't want us to have an experience of worship. Uh, he got it down to where there was an event of worship. What do I mean by that? Well, you find that the children of Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel, what do we find them doing? They bring a sacrifice to God. I'm not talking about what their sacrifice was. I'm not talking about if it was according to God's plan. or, or but, but they both still brought a sacrifice. And there's no way around it that it was no longer an experience, but now it's an event they worked for, and then they came to a place where, where, where it was just a, 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 an event. Event. It was interrupted. Worship was interrupted. And uh, their sons are engaged in this act of worship and bringing offerings. We read in Genesis 4, verse number 3 and 4. And so uh, we find that uh, it's no longer an experience, but it's an event. But we find that with the tabernacle, that God brings back into place something about worship. It's still an event, but it is also perpetual. Perpetual means that it's never stopping, it's always ongoing, much like that of the experience. What do I mean about the tabernacle being an event and being perpetual? Well, there were, there were elaborate details about the tabernacle, and there were appointed times of worship when there was offerings, when there were sacrifices, things happening, but all the way around the clock, day and night, there was perpetual worship going on. Even though that there were events, there was also perpetual worship that was there. And so, uh, uh, but we find that we now transition, and much was like that from the tabernacle to the temple, without getting into a lot of things, we move into the New Testament, and we find that really the experience of the believer is much like that of the tabernacle. What does the tabernacle mean? It means that there's a place that was picked up and moved around, but it was the dwelling place of God. And now, instead of the tabernacle housing the presence of God, we come into the New Testament and we find that because of grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, that now we are the tabernacles of God. Now we house the presence of God. And our lives are similar, almost equated to that of the tabernacle and the temple because there is perpetual. 
actual worship, but there is also a bit of worship as well. Amen. And so there are appointed times of worship. We think about this tonight. There is an appointed time of worship for American Revival Church. Some churches are Wednesday night. Ours have always, has always been Tuesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. But though we continue to worship God, otherwise it is perpetual, but it is also an event of worship. There are other events, but we know that this is a corporate event of worship. Why do I believe that church attendance is so important? Uh, Sister Tina, you said something that was similar to this, and then I, I kind of said something. Uh, 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 because we need to have that corporate worship because the Word of God commands us not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24 and 25. But it's much like this. Much of you know about fires, whether you build a campfire or whether you build a fire in your house. You know that if you have a log on the fire, that it burns brighter and hotter when it is combined with other logs. You take that log away and, and, and it doesn't burn as bright or as hot as what it does when it is corporately with the other logs. And so it is similar to that in worship. Because God wants us to gather together and worship so that we can burn brighter in our worship. Yes, at our, 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 our individual homes or workplaces or wherever we're at, we are burning worship to God by the light that we live. But we burn hard, hotter and even brighter in corporate worship because that's what God has instituted. And so uh, folks have often said to me, how often should I go to church? Well, where is your, for lack of a better term, where is your church or your faith community? Where is it at? And how often do they have church? That's how often you should attend. Because cor corporate worship is necessary. We need it. We burn hotter and brighter because of corporate worship. There will be times in our life where we can say, well, I have worship with God when I'm driving, I pray, or I have my devotions, or I have my music on, or when I am uh, 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 showering. Some people say there are other times, other ways, and they're, they're showering, no one's around bothering them, they, they're worshiping. Uh, uh, someone says that they're exercising, that's when I'm worshiping God, or I'm, I'm mowing the lawn. But, but I want to really encourage us tonight that we really need to have uninterrupted time of worship with God. I'm not saying those other times aren't good and we utilize them, but we can be distracted in those things. And so it's good for us to break open the Word of God, to pray and have a time of worship, amen, that is uninterrupted. It's no longer just perpetual, but it's an event. We schedule that event in our life. We schedule everything else. So why don't we schedule worship? I'm taking this time aside to worship. I schedule this. I know my work schedule for the most part. I know my church schedule. Uh, I can have things scheduled come up at the last minute. Uh, my weekends, I typically have things scheduled out. I have a list of things I need to do, and we mark off the list. I schedule. Why don't we schedule worship? It was in the tabernacle. Why don't we do that with our tabernacle? Scheduling corporate worship. Scheduling times of worship where we're worshiping God where it's really uninterrupted. God wants that with us. That personal time together and cultivate the practice of worshiping God. I want to challenge us. I'm going to give the challenge to myself and I've been trying to do this. Instead of turning the computer on or the television on, flipping through a magazine, or even laying down and taking a little siesta, why don't we instead say we take some time just to be with God and worship Him? Really, it's necessary in our life where we focus upon God. In Psalm 16, let me turn there. Psalm 16, verse number 7. The Word of God says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instructed me in the night seasons. Amen. Blessing God, and even in the night seasons, giving God that time of worship. 
Someone read Psalms 63, verse 6. Psalm 63, 6. Someone else read Psalms 119, verse number 48. Someone have Psalm 63, 6. When I remember to be upon my bed and meditate on me in the night watches. Amen. Scheduling even that time. Even if it's on our bed, to just spend time with God. Reading the Word of God, praying, listening to God, meditating on God. Someone read Psalms 119.48. Psalms 119, verse number 48. Amen. Schedule that time just to lift up our hands and thank God for His Word and those things that we meditate upon that is based in the Word of God. Really, that is worship. That is worship. Once again, in the Garden of Eden, did God bring back so much to us that was lost in the Garden of Eden? There will come a time when we'll be able to worship God around the throne of grace and in heaven. It's going to be uninterrupted. It's not going to be interrupted by sleep or schedules or, or uh, any distractions. Uh, uh, it's going to be just like it was in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? But you know what? God already made a way for the sacrifices of animals for there to be a, a, an event. And then God gave them the tabernacle, which was perpetual for some, but an event for many. But through the work of the cross, now we create a portion that it can be perpetual, but also an event in our life. And we need to make sure that we're perpetually worshiping God in everything that we do. That means by our actions, our attitude, by the way that we look at people, the way that we believe in people, the time that we give to people, but most of all, the time that we give to God. And then we need to schedule. Make sure that we're scheduling time to worship. What does Romans 12 1 say? We know this verse very well. Someone read it. Romans 12 1. Amen. Do you know what? When we give God our bodies, which the Word of God says is a living sacrifice, that means it is perpetual. Amen. It's living. It's not dying. It's living. It's continual until we go from this side to glory. Amen. We'll never stop praising Him. But we're giving Him a perpetual sacrifice. You know what we're doing? We're claiming and reclaiming that which was lost because we're offering Him a sacrifice. I, I want you to know that we look at that and yes, God wants our, our time. And time should be given by loving God and loving others and giving to the church. And God wants our talents. Virginia, you were saying, we all have different talents. Amen. I can't sing either. I can't, you know, there's a lot that I can't do. That's got, I, you know, I said, Tina, I'm glad that you like numbers. I would probably take the book and throw it on the floor and stomp on top of it uh, because it's not my thing. You know, uh, uh, God gave you your talents. And like Sister Holly said, sometimes we, we don't, none of us get to pick our talents. God gives us, some of us, we steal other talents and we become good, but there's some God-given talents that God gives us and then treasures that we have. But you know, uh, God really wants most, He wants our sacrifice. It's not just our talents, it's not just our time, it's not just our treasures, but God wants our sacrifice. And we are the sacrifice. He wants us, every part of us, perpetual. He wants it always. He wants it as an experience, but He also knows that we need to do it as an event. And we need to also do it as, as scheduling it. God, we want to give to you everything. God wants our worship. That's real worship tonight. And so as we're talking about worship over the past several weeks, I just pray that that, that encourages you that what we're doing, whatsoever that hand found to do, the Word of God says, do it with all thy might. Amen. Let's do it as worship unto God.
I really think it would change us. I have to tell you, last week, Brother Brim's message challenged me. It's changed my week. To think that we're going to be accountable for everything that we do. Everything. Every bit of energy we spend, how we spend each and every day. I've said this to you before, but every day, every one of us is given a gift. Think about this. It is a gift of 24 hours. So it's like you get this rechargeable card. God gives you another day. He recharges it for you every day. And he says, here's your card. You have 24 hours. It is a gift. It is a treasure. Sometimes when we, when you know, when you, when, when, when maybe when we have lived on a little bit less, we learn to scrimp and scrape, scrape and make it go a little farther. But then we start to achieve more. Isn't it a little easier to spend or, or, or you know, in any, any area of our life, we find that. And I think in our life, if we're not careful, we are haphazard with the way that we spend our time, the treasure that God gives us. So if He gave you a recharge card today, and He did, you're here. And He gave you 24 hours, the same as He did for me. How are we spending that? Because one day we will be accountable for everything that we, that we spend when it comes to our time. We're accountable with by, by our paycheck. You know, you spend more than you make, you're going to be in trouble. So you sit down and you figure out, what can I spend here and there? And what is the extra? And you know, you, you, you put a little bit of emergency fund away so that if you run into an emergency, you have it. You're, you're wise with that. And what about our time? Are we wise with our time in making sure that it is perpetual in worship, but also an event in worship? Jesus Christ died upon the cross, amen, so that he may give to us an opportunity Opportunity to reclaim what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. And my question to us tonight is, are we reclaiming it? Our bodies are a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. And really, if we sink our teeth into it, we'll realize we need to get to God. Don't be a law that's sitting out by itself. Are brighter and higher because God has blessed us with a church, a body of believers, a faith community that we share Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost when we share this gift of time with for as long as God shall allow. And none of us know how long that will be. Amen. Let's jump to our notes. I think that we're up on the point of Revelation 12, verse number 10. Your note page is a little different than mine. Uh, so I'm going to read Revelation 12, verse number 10. The whole thing is given to you in the notes. For the accuser of our brethren is cast out, which accused them before our God day and night. Who is the accuser of the brethren? The devil. He wants to rob our praise. He did it in the Garden of Eden. He robbed that perpetual worship. Amen. And what Jesus Christ has given us, that we can claim that place of perpetual worship, he wants to rob it from us. And he'll do it by, by people, other believers. We, we said in that previous, I'll, I'll read this, that previous uh, paragraph, there are Christians that every time a name is brought up, they can tell you nothing but dirt about them. They bring up things that happened 20, 30, or more years ago. What if that person has repented and God has forgiven them? What business do we, as a people who carry Christ's name, have fault-finding and gossiping? Do you know there are even some uh, re religious folks, some pastors, I, I can think of one that's in a limelight, I can think of one that, that I know personally, that you know that they, 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 uh, they had some things in their life, but you know that, that is 25, 30 years ago, maybe close to 40 years ago, and what fault do we have in finding if they put that beneath the blood? God bless their ministry. God bless their life. And
and what they are doing. Amen. The devil is the accuser of the brother. What Jesus Christ, amen, has forgiven. Who he whom the Son has set free, the Bible says, is free indeed. Aren't you glad God sets free? Amen. He frees us from our past. He frees other people. Amen. Their past that we have no right to point a finger and, and, and bring that up. Amen. May God bless them and help them as they go on for eternity. Amen. The, the, the uh, false accusers are categorized in the following scripture. Someone read 2 Timothy 3 5. I wonder what worship would be like if, if, if folks would really get to the place where they don't accuse someone falsely. There can be a lot of scenarios in someone's mind and they can accuse someone for something that may not even be so. The Word of God characterizes them in a group of saying that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Uh, the Word of God tells us from such, turn away. So I want to read Titus 2.3. Not false accusers. Amen. Thank God for those who are older in the faith. Amen. Thank God for that. And it should be that they behave in a manner, this is speaking of women, but it's men as well, in a way uh, as becometh holy. Amen. Let's read that next uh, paragraph. You may justify your accusations by saying, they are not false, but true. Is it God's truth or is it your own opinion? And if it is true, is it your responsibility to tell others about it? Amen. God help us that we don't preach worship in any way or hinder anyone from worship. Someone read James 4.11. James 4, 11. Someone have that James 4, 11? I'll give you the words if you just want to read. Speak not evil one of another, brother. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer. Amen. The Word of God commands us not to speak evil of our brother. Amen. Uh, we we, te we tell our children, if you can't say anything, did your parents tell you this? If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Amen. Do we practice, do we practice what we preach? Someone read James 1.26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridal, not in his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Alright, so if the tongue is not bridal, uh, the uh, uh, author of James, brother of, G uh, brother of Jesus, tells us that his religion is vain. Do you know why I believe that, that uh, God gave us the Holy Ghost and the sign evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking in other tongues. We just preached about that on Sunday morning. Talked about Pentecost, past that Sunday of Pentecost. That when God began to give man the Holy Ghost, and he got in his tongue, and the Word of God says that the tongue is an unruly evil. It's a small part, but it's hard to, to control. When the Holy Ghost gets in there, he controls it. Amen. Uh, by sign evidence of speaking in other tongues, but by the life of sanctification that follows after, by living life and walking life in the Spirit. Remember I said on Sunday morning that, that real religion is this. You 
know when, when they were trying to build the Tower of Babel and uh, they, they were trying to build up to God, they felt that they were uh, equal, maybe superior to God. God said, I'm going to confound your language. And they all began to speak in a different language. They were scattered. Uh, a false religion scatters folks, but true religion brings folks together. Amen. I love when the Holy Ghost begins to move. Amen. And uh, folks begin to get filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. Amen. And then there's a real revival and a real uniting of people together. That's what the Holy Ghost does. Amen. Real worship. Amen. Builds up the body of believers. Amen. It's that fire, that log that's there that burns warm and bright. Amen. When the Holy Ghost is there working and moving in folks. Amen. There's not chaos and criticalness and judgment. Amen. But there's not a building up and loving one another. Amen. That's worship. Amen. There are many there are ministry leaders who will criticize everyone else's way of ministering. Ministering. They must think their way is the only way it is to be done. Listen, I believe that when folks follow the Bible, Everyone may not worship or conduct things the way that I do. God made me me and God gave me vision and the direction that He wants me to be for my ministry. But because someone else does it differently doesn't mean that they are incorrect or they are wrong as long as they are following and accordance to the Word of God and teaching the truth, the whole truth of God's Word. And so we're not here to criticize one another, but we're here to build up one another. In fact, I'm, I'm going to be frank with you. Uh, I don't, I don't ever. The older I get, the more I think the Lord just gives you wisdom. I'm not here to criticize any other church. I don't even care about denomination. I'm going to do it our way. This is the way that we do it. This is the way we worship. This is the way we see it from God's word. I'm not intimidated that I think some other pastor is going to pull people from our church. I don't care. This is not my church. This is God's church. Amen. And I'm not worried about pulling someone from someone else's church. I'm not into that. We are in to building up the name of Jesus and building God's kingdom the right way. Amen. I love that. I love that. And I believe as long as we honor God in that, God will honor us. Don't you believe that tonight? Amen. Amen. God will do it. Amen. I mean, there may be times that there are some ministries that I believe that are uh, some, 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 some ministries that are out there in the limelight. There are some ministries that from time to time I may say a name. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to get folks directed in the right way. I believe that there are a lot of mega ministries that teach things that are contrary to the Word of God. And I think it is my job as the pastor to share what God's Word, the truth of God's Word, and give you biblical principle behind it that you may understand. Amen. How can God bless us when we are so critical of others? When we are so critical of others, let us be careful that we don't become so self-righteous, self-righteous, that we think God made us to be little gods. Little gods. To point our finger and snub our nose to others who are honestly striving to do what is right. Amen. If God gives you the chance to share the truth with someone, you know, uh, I found that I'm taught better by a gentle approach and give me the basis. And, uh, you know, when I start a new job, uh, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm uh, different than others, but... Uh, you know, I, I've had different shifts in my job uh, than I work. And so, even most recently, in a new shift in my job, I take a bunch of notes and write them out. And I read over those notes so that I can understand how to do it. And I have to tell you that I've been blessed with wonderful people who are willing to share with me and give me quality in what they're doing. And they want me to be as good or better than them. That's the way that we should be with other believers. Amen. That we're willing to invest in giving them uh, not a critical spirit. Personally, I don't like when someone comes at me with a harsh. Yeah, automatically, I just I'm kind of like a turtle. I just 
crawl in the shell and, you know, just feel like I don't want to be beaten by my God. And so the approach of just being able to be given the truth. I'm not saying that sometimes, you know, it's not hard. You know, we, none of us like to be told we're doing something wrong. You know, but we need to be teachable enough and we need to be willing to teach others with the right spirit that we can see them grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't you want to have good worshipers around you? Amen. Don't you want to be able to take folks from the edge of who they are and get them to launch out into the presence of God? That's worship. You know, sometimes you may say, but this is good. Why do you always say, let's lift our hands? You know, because I want to bring people out of where they're at and get them to move into the presence of God. And I'll always do that. I've done it for years, and I'll continue to do that. It's not a form. It's not a routine. But I want to get people, amen, to give that surrender to God and get them to the place of where they stand in awe of God. Sunday night I preached. I'm going to wrap things up and close it. Sunday night I preached on He makes everything beautiful in His time. You know, I, I, I want to get people... The sympathy, I want to give people the apathy, uh, or I'm sorry, the empathy, the apathy, empathy that they need in their situations. But Brother Doug, I also want to be at the place where I want to show them that God can work and move in this. I believe that God's not forgotten you. I believe God's not forsaken you. I believe that right now you may not understand. I might not see it. You may not see the outcome. But I'm confident because we love God that God's going to do something beautiful in the end of this. So keep trusting God. He's worthy to be trusted. You can rely on Him for strength. He will give you the strength that you need. Amen. It's bringing them to the edge of who they are and saying, I'll leap and jump into the presence of who He is. Leave who you are and trust Him for who He is. And that is where worship is found. And it may be that you have to make it an event I know that it should be an experience, but sometimes we have to make an event. Bungee jump off the, off the cliff. Amen. And know that you're in good hands. You're in better hands than that bungee cord. You want to do it? All power to you. I don't have faith in that bungee cord. Amen. But when it comes to spiritual jumping, I want to jump in because I know I'll land in the arms of God and He will see me through and in retrospect, it will be a beautiful experience mm -hmm. that I can gain from. I've matured, I've worshipped Him, and my life is displayed worship to a God that I made it perpetual, but this time I made it an event to worship Him. I'm done. Anybody have anything they want to say?